Um, thanks everyone for joining us on behalf of the Southeast Technological University. We're really delighted to welcome Dr. Michael O'Sullivan, who you all know and who's made a massive contribution to the disciplinary field and also to the culture of SETU uh, over the many years of his association. So many of you have, tra have traveled quite far and I want to thank you for making that journey. Since COVID, I think you'll agree that spirituality um, is massively important. I think we learned a lot about human nature and the nature of existing um, in the modern world over the last two years. When I first met Michael, um, he reminded me of the great poet Mary Oliver when she wrote, keep some, heart, keep some room in your heart for the unimaginable. Because I think that you know, all of these brilliant studies in spirituality are so critical to us as human beings and interrelational beings. Um, so on that note, I want to welcome Michael and thank him for giving us the time. Thanks, um, and enjoy everyone. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Susan, good. This jumped, let's see. Right. Hello, everybody, and great to see you all here. And I know some of you, has, as, as Susan has mentioned, have travelled a good distance, and I'm very appreciative to see you here today and in these conditions. And, of course, there are people here who are part of this story from the beginning, like Richard Hayes and Michael uh, negotiated with Bernadette and myself, bringing the MA programme to um, at what is now SETU some years ago and here we are still and going strong and getting stronger even because now we have not only the MA here but we also have PhD studies, we have a research unit in spirituality studies and we have a research fellow who's also going to be working with Bernadette and myself to produce the uh, Rutledge Handbook on Contemplative Methods for the Study of Spirituality which will be the leader in his field. So we're, 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 we're going well. and. Um, just to say too that you know we are now the only university in Ireland that is offering spirituality studies at postgraduate level, MA and PhD level and in the other ways I've mentioned. So it's, it is great that we're able to celebrate that, all that here today now as well. Uh, and just to mention as a, an example of the interest that's in spirituality studies, I put up a, a, a notice about the fact that we're now in SCTU in a university with spirituality studies uh, last month and f uh, on my own LinkedIn page and uh, 2,600 people have viewed that uh, post. So that will give an example, uh, an illustration really of the interest there is worldwide in this uh, form of study. So anyway, let me get going then. As you know, my talk today is on spirituality in the university. And uh, right. Well, in 2008, I wrote an article uh, about spirituality as a new academic discipline, uh, which it really was still at that stage, and we've come a long way since, as I've been saying. But in the article, I was identifying six signs, really, of a new academic discipline. And then I was trying to say that uh, these signs are being fulfilled by spirituality, which then means that it is actually a new academic discipline because it has met those six signs. The six signs I picked out were, uh, firstly, the a number of voices in the academy and in third level institutions who uh, were saying that such a phenomenon of spirituality as a new academic discipline was emerging. Second sign was the number of scholars and practitioners working in third level institutions who were self-identifying what they were now doing as spirituality, having perhaps studied or started in, uh, in other disciplines like Sandra Schneider started in biblical studies, for example. A third sign was that the new academic publications, books, dictionaries and journals that were coming out on this new discipline. A fourth sign was the creation of distinctive societies of scholars and practitioners of the emerging discipline. A fifth sign was the holding of major conferences in the emerging discipline. And a sixth sign was the establishment of departments, programs, um, awards and research and so on in the discipline. And uh, all of those criteria have been met by spirituality and on that basis we can say that yes, it is a new academic discipline, I was saying back then in 2008. Now, I, I of course then um, 
Regarding major conferences, for example, just take that one as an, an illustration. The first conference in, in Europe on the academic study of spirituality took place in Middletown Park, the Jesuit Centre in Middletown Park in Dublin in 2004, just four years before that article was published. The main organiser of that uh, conference was my colleague Bernadette, and I was happy to serve with her on that organising committee. So we go, we go back all that time and we've come all the way since. Now, as well as those six criteria, really, to show that a new academic discipline has emerged, any new discipline and spirituality, therefore, has to also meet other criteria. As well as meeting the criteria for a new academic discipline, spirituality in university settings must also have a distinctive identity. It must have its own field of study, and it must have a distinctive way of, of studying the field. Uh, thirdly, besides those two issues, spirituality university, university discipline also faces a third challenge, namely how to preserve its integrity by not denying its self-implicating character. The self-implicating character of spirituality is illustrated in what Marlon Brando was reputed to have said when he was dying. What was all that about? <laughs> because of our spiritual core, we experience our lives against the backdrop of questions like who am I, where have I come from, why am I here, and where am I going when I die? Sometimes these personal implicating questions loom large for us, and at other times then they just lie in slumber deep. Because this journey into mystery, however, is not neutral for us, disciplines that study it like spirituality cannot be true to themselves if they try to be value neutral. So they are self-implicating. This refusal of spirituality as an academic discipline to adopt a supposedly detached stance in order instead to preserve its integrity brings us to a fourth challenge for spirituality in the university, namely how to reconcile subjectivity and objectivity. Inclusivity. Fifthly, in today's world, spirituality in the university also needs to be studied in a way that can include everyone while at the same time providing for the differences that do exist between, for example, people who live with a religious spirituality and those who are more at home and self-identifying as spiritual but not religious. One implication of this position is that spirituality studies can no longer be, as they were in the past, theology-led. As well as catering for the different spirituality life views, the inclusive character of spirituality as university discipline must also cater for the rapidly growing phenomenon of spirituality and, which is the most striking development in the discipline in the years since that article of 2008. The descriptor spirituality and refers to spirituality and social care, spirituality and business, spirituality and health care, spirituality and leadership, and so on. And then the Rutledge International Handbook uh, of Spirituality and Society in the Professions, which my colleague Bernadette was the co-editor of, it has 51 chapters, different chapters about spirituality and a profession. And that really shows us then the extent to which spirituality studies and research are reaching into virtually every area of human endeavor. My way of addressing these issues of identity, integrity, um, inclusivity and objectivity for spirituality as a university discipline is by means of what I call the spiritual practices of authentic subjectivity. The praxis is spiritual because it is grounded in a foundational and permeating sensibility and self-transcending capacity uh, towards meaning and value in life. My approach owes much to the work of Bernard Lonergan a Canadian Jesuit who died in 1984 before spirituality began to develop as an academic discipline. In order to explain what I mean by the practice of authentic subjectivity, I invite you to engage in an imaginative experiment. Some of my stu students are well aware of this experiment. Imagine that each of us is listening to this lecture, listening to this lecture, is sitting quietly in a public park when suddenly there is a cry for help. Uh, we'll just pause for a moment. I just want you to enter into that scene and pay attention to what goes on in you as you do. You're in that scene and what is going on in you.
okay, if we are attentive to our experience in the scene, we will hear the cry. And bodily reflections and images, bodily reactions and feelings and, uh, and images to do with what might be happening will arise in us. All of which shows that our self-presence is not self-enclosed, but is inherently receptive and relational in character. So how do we respond from within this kind of self-presence to our experience of the cry? Do we ignore the cry and push the images and reactions and feelings that come with it away? Or are we moved to attend more acutely to the cry? If the latter, do we find ourselves moved from within, beyond the experience of hearing the cry, to a higher form of self-presence that enables us not only to attend to the data, that is the cry, but also to seek an understanding of it by asking questions like, what does the sound uh, I have heard mean? Does it mean that somebody is in trouble? Or is it that there is a drama group in the park today and they're acting out their roles? Given that both are possible, do we find ourselves being pushed, pulled, attracted uh, to move to a higher level again in ourselves where we are engaged in not only understanding but also judging, judging between different possible interpretations? By making the inner move to judge, uh, which understanding of the situation is correct, we have entered a self-transcending self-presence or subjectivity that relates to reality out of a desire for truth. We're not content with just any interpretation. We want the truth. Staying with our practice of self-attention to our lived experience in the park, do we find that the unfolding a spirit's desire at work in us does not leave us content with coming to know what is happening, but continues to prod us until we decide what are we going to do about what we have come to know. I mean, do we say, ah, now I know somebody's in trouble. <laughs> That's very interesting. And go back and sit down and read our book again in the park. Or do we say, you know, somebody's in trouble. I know that now. That's the meaning of the cry. What am I going to do about it? by, for example, you know, calling the police or looking around and seeing is there somebody else around who can give us a hand to address the situation. Our participation, therefore, in the illustrative imaginative experiment, when we participate reflexively, discloses that we connect with reality methodologically, not by bypassing our subjectivity, uh, you know, as though reality was out there and we just had to look at it. But we have to go into our subjectivity. We have to participate authentically in it in order to reach methodologically where objectivity lies. The experiment shows that we have a common human capacity in our subjectivity that is normatively oriented to attending to relevant data uh, when experiencing, to asking relevant questions when seeking understanding, to settling only for what is true, or most probably true, when judging between different possible interpretations, and to acting consistently, consistently with correct knowledge uh, in order to do good uh, when deciding between courses of action. At the highest level, this desire to do good takes the form, really, of gracious loving, unconditional gracious loving. We can name this desiring, permeating and self-transcending capacity in our human subjectivity, the spirit of authenticity. Participating authentically in our subjectivity in terms of being faithful to this spirit means something different depending on whether we are engaged in experiencing, in understanding, in judging or in deciding. When researchers are engaged in experiencing they can detect the spirit of authenticity at work in their embodied subjectivity and socially located self as a call from inner depth to attend to all relevant data. That's how you'll 
become aware there is this spirit at work in you. You are being pushed to attend to all relevant data. When they are engaged in understanding, uh, they can detect the spirit of authenticity in an inner call to raise all the relevant questions. When they are engaged in judging, the spirit of authenticity is detected in the form of an inherent imperative to not settle for less than what is true or most probably true. And when they are engaged in deciding, the spirit of authenticity is detected in us in an inherent desire to enact what is good and even unconditional loving. In every instance, we are being called to act in fidelity to the unfolding spirit of authenticity as our ground and guide. And by doing so, we grow in the process into an increasingly authentic person and researcher. In the case of our imaginative experiment, fidelity to the dynamic spirit of authenticity in our subjectivity transforms us from being a person caught up in uh, recreational activity, which we were maybe at the beginning, uh, into one caught up in researching and addressing a situation that may involve the well-being of others. This discovery uh, shows that being a good researcher goes beyond professional training and education to the level of authenticity in the researcher as a person. Being a good researcher requires personal development as well as professional training. Now, as well as in functioning in an upward movement from experience through understanding and judgment to decision making, this process of knowing and choosing under the impact of the spirit of authenticity in us also functions in the reverse order. We might actually begin with, first of all, a decision to trust or believe. And on the basis of that decision, then move on to judgments of belief, not just judgments of fact. And on the basis of our judgments of belief, we may be moved to try and understand these judgments of belief. And then on the basis of that understanding, see how to bring it on into lived experience in ways that can be enlightening and transformative for that experience. For example, similar to Dag Hammarskjöld, the late and inspiring Secretary General of the United Nations, who once said that at some moment he decided to say yes to someone or something with a capital S in each case, and that made all the difference, he said, for his life from then on, the spirituality researcher may decide, firstly, to trust that God exists and is a God of love, and secondly, on the basis of that yes, make the judgment of belief that there could be an incarnation as a self-communication of God's love to and for the world. And thirdly, on the basis of that judgment of belief in such a God, and such a loving God, seek to work out an understanding of how the maleness of Jesus is also liberating for women. And fourthly, on the basis of that understanding, seek to communicate with people's lived experience regarding the situation of women in ways that can enlighten and transform it. We live our lives with a spirit of authenticity functioning with both modes of knowing and choosing. The methodology of authentic subjectivity is also subject, of course, to inauthenticity. Um, it has to contend with counter forces of inauthenticity. These can exist in individuals in the form, for example, of the refusal to be open to all relevant uh, data because of fear or prejudice and so on, the refusal to raise all the relevant questions because of unease about self-implication, the willingness to settle for false interpretations and to make decisions that are simply self-serving. These counterforces in individuals may be due not only to the way the individuals are in themselves, but also to the pressures exerted on them from outside in the form, for example, of constraints imposed by the culture, institutions, organizations, or groups in which they participate. The achievement then of how authentic people can be in their self-presence to themselves, others, and the world is not only a personal, but also a communal achievement. The communal achievement will include the fund of favorable experiences, favorable socialization, 
favourable circumstances in a person and a population, and the level of development of historical knowledge in a given era. This communal achievement may be needed at times to correct individual experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding, but it may also of course need at other times to self-correct in the light of the impact on it of individual attentiveness, insights, judgments and decisions regarding where authenticity lies. Sometimes, too, interaction between an individual and, for example, a communal religious tradition may lead to breakthrough experiences at unexpected depths where the person believes they have come into contact, into communion with God, the divine, the absolute loving mystery of goodness at the heart of life, however this mystery is named. Many people have had this gifted experience of something outside the world coming often unexpectedly uh, to meet them at soul depth. These are experiences of what are called grace and they add to the capacity of our natural spirit of authenticity and of the level of communal development in persons, society and history. Those who undergo such experiences find that their common human spirit of authenticity, which guides their experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding, has to be regrounded, so to speak, on this elevating, mysterious foundation and in its horizon are beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love. I referred already to Hammerschull's experience, but his encounter was with a mystery that had no name, a someone or something, as he called it, with a capital S. And I offer, I offer now an example from my own life where the encounter with the mystery, with a capital M, was more clearly connected with a socialised religious affiliation. When my brother, sister and I were small children, my father, in arriving home in the evenings from work, he would come and say goodnight to us. On one of those nights, when I was five or maybe it was six, he asked us, had we said our night prayers? And I answered, I had had a toothache that day. Now, given the culture of the time, uh, my father might have responded, because I'm the age I am now, but, <laughs> which is part of the reason why we're here today. <laughs> but Michael, he said, he could have said, we're talking here about praying to God, and could you not do that even with a toothache? But instead, he replied, that I did not have to say my prayers then as God would understand how I was feeling. Utterly unexpectedly, his words immediately impacted in me in a way that led to a deep, warm, peaceful experience. I experienced myself in my embodied consciousness, being reassured, being cared for. I experienced that my pain mattered, that I mattered to God. I experienced and understood that God was a kind God, and that this profound realization was being gifted to me at a profound level in myself and from beyond myself in this world. Reflecting on what happened that evening in later life has enabled me to identify that this experience regarding the reality of God as a God of kindness, compassion, care and understanding was so powerfully transformative in my subjectivity that it became a foundational criterion for me in how to be an authentic human being. Whatever was in line with that experience could be trusted, and whatever contradicted it had to be rejected or opposed. For example, my decision to go to Chile in the early 1980s as a missionary to tackle the brutal military dictatorship of General Pinochet who claimed to be a loyal Catholic, was influenced by my desire to mediate the kind God of my childhood into the Chilean situation for the sake of its transformation. As well as experiences of Hammerschild and me, the route for some to a spirituality of authenticity rooted in a religious conversion can be that of reflecting on the reality of the mysterious existence of our spirit of authenticity. The great German Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner once said that if God wished to reveal God's self to us, then God must have made us in such a way that we could recognize and respond to such a revelation. 
On this basis, some may decide that their desiring spirit of authenticity, uh, drawing them towards beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love for their own life and the life of the world, can be trusted to be an implicit desire for God in the very nature of their humanity, and so understand their lived responses to that gifted desire as a self-giving to God through how they live their lives. Having articulated what I mean by the spiritual practices of authenticity, of authentic subjectivity, which can and does function in both directions, we can now return to the issues of identity, integrity, uh, objectivity and inclusivity that were referred to earlier as issues to be met for the sake of the standing of spirituality in the university. You will have noticed that these issues received some attention already in the course of our study of the imaginative experiment and my explanation of authentic subjectivity. But let's go further. Regarding the two identity issues of spirituality and academic disciplines stated early on in my presentation, the first question becomes, how does the methodology of authentic subjectivity establish the scope of the field of spirituality studies? Academic disciplines tend to form around distinctive material as their object of study. For example, English literature studies, poetry, prose and plays, etc. Maths studies, numbers, calculus and equations, etc. Theology studies, Bible, church history and canon law, etc. But the position I am arguing for in the case of spirituality as an academic discipline is that it forms its field of study, not by sectioning off material that others can agree identifies the field of that discipline, but through what self-attention discloses when people are engaged in the lived practice of knowing and choosing in any field of material, be it knowing and choosing in the field of literature, maths, theology and so on. Self-attention to what is going on inside the person while engaged in knowing and choosing in any field of inquiry, teaching, research and action shows that the desiring spirit of authenticity in their subjectivity functions in every one of those fields of inquiry and action, and therefore in every profession, in every discipline, and in the whole gamut of lived experience. In other words, when spirituality is conceived as an academic discipline, is conceived in terms of the study of the embodied spirit of authenticity in human knowing and choosing, its field of study is all-encompassing. Nothing is outside the scope of its field. Identity, the second issue, how to study the field. The methodology of authentic subjectivity also answers the second identity issue raised earlier, namely, how is the vast field of spirituality studies to be studied? Which is to say, what are we looking for when studying what comes within this field and what guides us when choosing resources to find what we seek. To answer this twofold question, it is helpful to distinguish in terms uh, to distinguish between doing and making. Studying what lies within the field of spirituality in terms of the methodology of authentic subjectivity involves studying what individuals and collectives do, namely experience, understand, judge and decide, and what they make, namely meaning, in the form of lives, texts, traditions and universities, etc. If people's meaning making is studied in terms of the presence or absence of authenticity, in their experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding, that is their quality of doing in making meaning, and in terms of how well the meaning object they express or enact correlates with the beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love that the spirit of authenticity in their subjectivity desires, then the study is spirituality study. That's a big point. For example, a researcher studying the life and work of Karl Marx as an exercise in the study of spirituality, would start by seeking to find in Marx's life and work, uh, his writings, evidence of his presence 
of his presence to the dynamic spirit of authenticity in his subjectivity and to identify what the meaning object of that desiring spirit is for him. Evidence of this spirit and what for him it desires is evident in the essay he wrote when leaving school at the age of 17. He wrote, the main principle which must guide us in the selection of a vocation, his word, is the welfare of humanity. If a person works only for himself, he, she, can perhaps be a famous scholar, a great wise man, wise woman, a distinguished poet, but never a completely, genuinely great person. But when we have chosen the vocation in which we can contribute most to humanity, burdens cannot bend us because they are only sacrifices for all. We see here that Marx is conceiving fidelity to his spirit of authenticity as a vocation to the welfare of humanity, as its meaning object, which is to be lived out no matter what the cost, as he puts it, which would remind you evokes Christ on the cross. But because he sought to live out his call to enact such meaning in a historical context where the collective of the Christian religion at that time did not, as he saw it, support his call, and even opposed it, he gradually moved to becoming an atheist. Just one year later he wrote, Never can I be at peace, for my soul is powerfully driven. There had to be some fault in the universe, the dumb agony of pain wrapped all round her. The world which bulks between me and the abyss I will smash to pieces with my enduring curses. Echo of Samson in the Bible story. I'll throw my arms around its harsh reality. We roar our melancholy hymns to the Creator with scorn on our brows. Chained. Eternally chained. Eternally. We are the apes of a cold God. Marx's passionate, soulful words as a young man express what can be called his spirituality, understood as a determined and sustained desire to live authentically in and in relation to the world of his time, a vocation, as he put it, to express and enact meaning that would serve the welfare of humanity. The spirituality researcher would also seek to track Marx's fidelity or infidelity to this conversion in the course of his life and work. Such research would call for knowledge of the world from which his writings emerged, knowledge of the world he sought to project forward in his writings, and knowledge of the world that came into being beyond his writings. In the light of that hermeneutical triangle of historical worlds, the spirituality researcher would attend to the quality of Marx's attention to data when experiencing, the quality of his questioning when seeking understanding, the quality of his interpreting when judging, and the quality of his deliberating when deciding. In this way, the researcher could be led to hold that Marx's spirit of authenticity was thrown off course by his historical conditioning because he failed to see the potential in Christianity to be a resource for social transformation. For example, he did not foresee the developments that would take place in Christianity with the emergence of liberation spirituality and theology in the 1960s, and the conference of bishops at Medellin, Colombia in 1968. These developments moved the Catholic Church in Latin America and beyond to a preferential option for the economically poor. Thousands of Christians were martyred for their faith-based stance for the welfare of their people in Latin America in the years after Medellin, an outcome which would have seemed impossible to Marx in his day. Fidelity to the spirit of authenticity as the way to study Marx's life and work in terms of spirituality would call for positions based on his work to be revised in the light of having to take into account the new data, understanding, judgments and decisions 
regarding authentic Christianity's potential for and actualization of social transformation that emerged after his deaths. Integrity. Regarding spirituality's need to preserve its integrity while functioning in the academy, we can hold that recourse to personal experience and acceptance of self-implication are in keeping with the integrity of the discipline's uh, desire to reach the truth and do the good, as long as what guides the researcher is not a self-enclosed subjectivism, but an experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding subjectivity that is opened out in the quality of its receptivity, relationality, reflectivity, responsibility and reflexivity to the exigencies of authenticity as the normative path to beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love. My disagreement with Marx's meaning-making, grounded in the doing of his subjectivity, illustrates this point. Objectivity and spirituality in the university. Regarding the issue of objectivity, the imaginative exercise also illustrates that authentic subjectivity resolves the subject-object issue for spirituality as an academic discipline. It does so by showing that there is no out-there-now reality, no out-there-now objectivity but only the objectivity mediated methodologically by participation in the process of authentic subjectivity. At one and the same time, the researcher, for example, develops the quality of their experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding according to what carrying out their research at the standard of authentic subjectivity regarding these operations requires of them and discovers the level of objective meaning and value in what they set out to research in a text, life, tradition or situation, etc. This position means that authentic subjectivity and objectivity are, in their, are correlative and that authentic subjectivity in the research and objectivity in their research outcomes are correlative. Inclusivity of life views. Regarding the first issue of uh, inclusivity, namely inclusivity with respect to life views, Studying spirituality in terms of the innate desire, innate spirit of authenticity in common human subjectivity provides a way of focusing on what people have in common in developing their life views and world views. It also provides a way to explain the different paths they take by drawing attention to variations in data attended to, questions asked, interpretations arrived at, judgments made and decisions taken when differences that arise can be explained in terms of how people functioned differently from such a common methodological foundation due in part to differences in socialization and historical contexts, there is an intelligible basis for dialogue and cooperation. <coughs> My treatment of Marx illustrates that point also. Regarding the second aspect of inclusivity, namely spirituality and the professions and spirituality and other disciplines, establishing the content of the field of spirituality according to the scope of the spirit of authenticity and engaging in the study of that field encompassing field by searching for the presence or absence of authenticity in the functioning of the operations of people's knowing and deciding and the extent to which what is produced in that way correlates with the beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love that authenticity desires, all that <coughs> makes spirituality an inherently interdisciplinary discipline. It does so because every discipline can shed light on spirituality's focus on the quality of fidelity to the spirit of authenticity that individuals and collectives function with in relation to the mystery of existence and lived experience in all the different settings. They also shed light on the extent to which what people produce in that way are expressions or not of beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love. The same goes for the professions and indeed all available resources, including therefore art, nature and music, etc. and practices like prayer, pilgrimage and silence, etc. But besides what diverse disciplines, professions and other resources can offer to spirituality studies, spirituality in the university can also serve all these resources of learning 
because academic disciplines and professions function necessarily under the impact of the tension between authenticity and inauthenticity in individuals and collectives, and so can be studied to learn when and how the meaning and skills they offer are expressions of experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding at the standard of authenticity or not. That gives a spirituality dimension to the diverse disciplines and professions and highlights the need for those engaged in them to become familiar with and gain competence in appropriating and applying their own praxis of authentic subjectivity. To conclude, spirituality, as the name suggests, studies spirit. The spirit it needs to focus on, in my view, is the enlightening and empowering embodied spirit of authenticity in human subjectivity. When functioning as it can, and especially when aided by factors favourable to it, which can include religious factors, factors which, as I've said, can even reground it, this spirit provides normative guidance towards beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love as its objective fruits. It does so by means of its exigent effects on the foundational sensibility and self-transcending operations of experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding constitutive of people's knowing and choosing so that these operations function as they can. Doing research, writing, teaching, leadership and administration, etc. in the university, according to this methodology of authentic subjectivity, is a contemplative and rigorous spiritual practice and requires those doing the research and lecturing, etc., to self-appropriate their practices of authenticity. It also shows both the field of spirituality studies to be set by the unlimited scope of the dynamism for authenticity and the resources it draws on to do such studies to be open-ended. Researching or teaching about lives, texts, traditions, etc. in terms of spirituality is about enlightening people regarding the spiritual quality in terms of authenticity, present or absent, in the experiencing, understanding, judging and deciding of the individuals and collectives who created such lives, texts, traditions, etc. It is also about empowering people towards conformity or transformation regarding the meaning and value conveyed in those lives, texts and traditions, depending on which is called for by fidelity to the spirit of authenticity. In that way, spirituality studies enable people to be sources of... I've lost my final paper, not to worry. Enables people to be sources of higher order levels of beauty, intelligibility, truth, goodness and love in life. Therefore, no university can be without spirituality studies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Brenda, you have a, a microphone, have you? We have a little time for questions and answers. Great, Bernie, thanks. So, Michael, yes. Uh, just one question. Uh, well, I your, your voice is, yeah, you're, you're questions. reaching me. I think you're all right, Bernie. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. reaching me, yeah. Uh, just two, two things struck me. Um, the relationship, the subject object relationship is a very complex um, kind of dynamic. Mm. Um, very complex. Yeah. Yes, they are, cor they are they correlate, yeah. Right. Um, does that not, uh, is, is, there, is there a danger in that, that somehow the truth of something, not, that the truth of something is within, is that what you're saying? 
No, I'm saying methodologically, the only way we can know whether something is true or not is by participating authentically in our subjectivity. And to the extent that we do that, we will be able to come out saying this is true or not true. So you only get to know what's objective by going through your subjectivity in an authentic manner, according to the way I mentioned it, tending to all the data, asking all the relevant questions and so on. Uh, and so, you know, that's the only way we can know what's true. You know, what's out there, we, we only know it by going through it, through our subjectivity to know, to discover it. Well, you can only know what's objectively there or not by going through your subjectivity. So sure. that's the only access we have. And to say that, uh, to even raise that question, that question is coming from something in your subjectivity, you know. And if you explore that more, you'll be trying to discover what makes me and my subjectivity raise such a question. Uh, and so you're all the time having to be going through your subjectivity to come out on the other side. And that's why I say you can't just set subjectivity aside and think it's all out there and I just have to look out and see it. Yeah, we can I, I, would, I would say, though, the corollary of that, though, is that somehow this subject I read uh, has to be in a certain way, there has to be a certain humility before, um, uh, in, in my subjectivity, be, uh, and in recognition of there being an object of something out there. Yeah, well, as I say, authentic subjectivity does include things like being humble, being open. Yeah. You know, if you're open, then you're, you're, you have to be humble because uh, you're not sort of deciding everything in advance. You're willing to kind of reconsider, to change your mind or whatever, and in that sense, be humble about how you're proceeding. So, yeah, uh, that's all true. Um, you, yeah. It does require some humility. Sorry, sorry, just one yeah. comment. Um, John O'Donoghue, uh, the, the well-known man... God bless him. Wrote, yeah. Yeah. He talked very much and he made a point uh, at length about the intersection between spirituality, poetry, and believe it or not, theology. Yes, okay. yes. Um, I, I, I sense, uh, again, in, in, in your early on in your talk, you talked about actually the separation, very much the separation as opposed to the intersection between spirituality and theology. Yeah. No, I'm saying that spirituality is an inherently interdisciplinary subject, and that means then that theology too has to have a say. But it, I think the problem, what I was really trying to say, I suppose, was, was that in the past, uh, I was speaking with a colleague, for example, there a few days ago, and he wanted to know how come that Loyola Institute didn't bring spirituality studies from Middleton into Loyola Institute. After all, he said, you know, you know the Jesuits and others set up the Loyola Institute really to forward the study of Catholic theology, our theology in the Catholic tradition, to be precise. Uh, but it left us, it only, it only brought theology forward. And spirituality was growing at a great rate in Middletown Institute at the time, and Bernadette was the head of the studies there. She's left, is she? Uh, and uh, um, so we were going great guns, but they decided, no, we just, we're, we're, we're worried about theology's decline. And if we get into a state university, we can hopefully bring it up. And so they let everything go to do that. And he said to me, how come he said that um, the Jesuits didn't bring on spirituality into the Loyola Institute? After all, he said, uh, spirituality is really about mystical theology and ascetical theology. And in the past, that is the way he was focused uh, in terms of those mystical theology and ascetical theology. But I said to him, it's now a new discipline, you know, and theology is only one discipline it dialogues with. It also dialogues with health sciences, with uh, social care, with business studies, with philosophy, uh, with art, you name it. And theology is still important, but it has to take its place among other disciplines as well. So we're certainly not ruling out theology, it certainly has something to offer, um, but it, it must realize that it too has to be humble and say, we're no longer the only thing that matters to spirituality, or we, it's no longer a case of us deciding how spirituality should develop. Other disciplines too have an input. And that's the shift, really. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, thanks, uh, Philip. Oh, Bernie, you're there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Richard. Yeah, we may not need the mic, but just in case we have it. Yeah, I think actually the mic. We need the mic if we were to, if the recording was to pick up voices, but. Anyway. Just two, two things. I think I really like. 
like that idea of interdisciplinarity of the subject because uh, I think it is certainly the way universities are evolving into mm. much more interdisciplinary spaces and the old division of disciplines mm. is collapsing across the board mm. Mm. Um, and that's a good thing I think mm. uh, methodologically and in terms of the discipline themselves it's a good thing I suppose if, from a practical point of view where would the books be in the library is the question <laughs> and, and I think it's it, it, library as a sort of a representation of knowledge. Of yes. Things. It's useful to think about where things lie, but I, I, that's just a sort of practical question. Yes. I too, I, I, I would, with respect, I think you maybe overread over -read, uh, early Marx and his, maybe you could, one could argue these were the reflections of a sentimental teenager and that I, in his growing up he became more enlightened than less enlightened or more authentic than less, less authentic. I always feel when I read biographies of Marx, he was nearly the most authentic human being you could meet because he was so bullish and so uh, convinced of everything that he had to say. But th 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 that's just a, a minor point. I suppose my two, my two questions really are, a word that you didn't mention much in the talk um, is the word God. And I wonder, uh, you know, do you need that hypothesis in this construct? I'd like to hear a little bit more about the relationship between authenticity and God, because when one thinks of spirituality, one immediately thinks of God, not uh, necessarily of a particular form of attentiveness, which is, it seems to be a lot to do with what you're saying. And then my, my second question is, um, touch a little bit on what Philip was talking about, maybe, I don't know, but I was so moved um, to find a clip on the internet from a series that I remembered from my childhood called The Ascent of Man. Mm, I know it. Jacob uh, Bratislavsky, this great mm. public educator, mm. talks about science and saying there's a false understanding about science is all about certainty and being absolutely objective. And, it, and in fact, and all the great scientists that we have in this institution here and that we all know, they are such doubting people. Doubt is so central to the university, actually. Mm -hmm. We're always at the Edge of error, mm -hmm. as Bronowski says, we're always <laughs> on the precipice of being wrong. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't. I could. Could you say a little bit about where doubt fits? Sure. In the in the in the discipline in, in spirituality. Yeah. That's kind of my main. Question. Right. Okay. Well, I'll take that one last. That last one first. Then. Well, my notion of authentic subjectivity, you know, is all about allowing for doubt because you're all the time open, you know, you're open to new data and new questions and new insights and new interpretations and you never start to say, well, you know, this is it forever now because you might change about that in the light of new evidence. So doubt is at the heart of authentic subjectivity, but at the same time you don't want to be so doubting as that you'll never make a commitment. So you commit, but you also leave it open to being able to revise your position because you know you may not actually have come to the end of the of the in, of the inquiry or whatever. So yeah, doubt, doubt is I, uh, loads self, of room for doubt. doubt. I, I oh, I'm self-doubt. Self yeah. doubt. I, I suppose yeah. that we, we, we're surrounded by laboratories here. They're 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 so full of self-doubt. Am yeah. I doing the experiment correctly? Mm. Am I reading the results the right way? Yes. Yes. And yes. By the way, when I replicate it tomorrow, I get a different result. Oh, yes, God, you know. of course. But I think that sense of self-doubt is so important. In the it, it is. And that's why I spoke, Richard, about the quality of our experiencing, interpreting, understanding, judging, deciding, and all that. They were all the time kind of open to improving the quality of how we function in these ways, uh, precisely because what comes out is going to be a, a reflection of how well we functioned in terms of those things. So yes, self-doubt is, is at the heart of it as well. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I hope I got that across. It's essential to humility and self-doubt. These are absolutely essential to the process. Uh, and so you, an authentic person is a very open person, it seems to me, because you know, you, 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 know you're, you're, you know you may be wrong, and at the same time you have to stand somewhere in the meantime, but you're open to change. Uh, all the time in the light of new, and that's what I say, like with Marx and his, his authenticity, I, I, I was trying to portray Marx actually as somebody who was very moved by authenticity right through his life, and uh, but uh, you know, he was moved, uh, through, uh, through, uh, moved by authenticity in the context of his time, 
and so certain things weren't really maybe as available to him as they were to later generations. You know, in his day, the, some of the developments that took place in Catholic social thought and theology and all that weren't taking place at that time, and he could only go with what he had available to him to consider. But I would say that somebody like him, you know, then would want to reconsider his position in the light of new evidence that came on after his life, after his death, uh, because he was wanting to serve the welfare of humanity, and whatever could do that for him was the thing to, to go with. Uh, but in, the, his, in his day, the Christian tradition, as he saw it, was an obstacle. And so he felt to be faithful to his desire to be authentic in, the, in relation to being serving the welfare of humanity, he had to move away from it. But if he saw a different, a different version of the Christian tradition, which certainly was there in Latin America in the 1960s and 70s in particular, um, that would have made him, made him think differently about the Christian tradition. And as I mentioned, like all those thousands of people were martyred for their Christian faith in Latin America in the 70s particularly, uh, would have really made him think about what he thought about what he could offer. But he could only go what he knew in his time and it's very understandable that somebody who was authentic would actually move away from it in his time. But uh, So I, I'm very much of the view that he's trying to be authentic, but it's, it's historically contextualised, the authenticity, as it is for all of us. Uh, you bought the library. Now, Bernadette, you'll be good on the library question. <laughs> we have the first catalogued spirituality library. Go on. Yeah, this has been a challenge, and uh, you know, I've talked to people in different parts of the world about how do you, I mean, librarians, people in library science, how do you manage a spirituality library? And I suppose it's a little bit like the unfolding discipline. The, st the stand we might take now would be different to maybe 10 years' time, but as an emerging discipline where you're trying to plot what the contours are, uh, we have made the decision to uh, perhaps use the Rutledge International Handbook of Spirituality and Society as kind of the text that creates a, a cataloging system because within spirituality, as in within psychology or whatever, you have to decide what are the categories within it. So at the moment, uh, we are focusing on, focusing on contemporary applied spirituality interprofessional. So the library is organized according to the profession, spirituality and education, architecture, engineering, maths, fi physics, whatever you want, 52 categories. It's not available. We've had to invent this and hopefully we can work with library science people after we have it done to see is it adequate. Uh, it, it will be provisional uh, into the future. Perhaps some of those sections will be put back into nursing or whatever it might be, or maybe you have to have two collections. I'm sure this already happens in maths or other areas where you need the maths for business, uh, but you also need maths in their own right too. So yeah, so the provisional decision regarding library, which is which has been taken time to come to, has been to catalogue according to the sub-specialisations that are emerging in spirituality now, which are mostly around the professions. Thanks, Bernadette. Yeah. Else. And just maybe to add yes. that, uh, you know, Sister Grace Redmond is here today and yes. it is the Presentation Sisters who are sponsoring the, the development of that library. It costs about 20,000, 25,000 a year mm -hmm. to build, uh, to create a spirituality library at this time. So uh, we're grateful for that. It takes a lot to build a new yes. uh, discipline because there are questions uh, like library and the particular kind of training and the participation in the international conferences that are necessary to ensure that we're at the frontiers of the discipline. And then, so it's great that next year the International Network for the Study of Spirituality will bring their conference here for the first time. They're taking it away from their own base in the UK and bringing it here to the campus, uh, the SETU campus in Waterford. So all of this is part of kind of being at the frontiers and yet not becoming idiosyncratic but working with the best peers internationally uh, for the work that we're doing. Yeah, great, Bernadette. Yeah, uh, the 16th to the 18th of May 2023, we will have an international conference uh, on spirituality, critical reflection, and uh, professional practice here in SETU. 
and it'll be the first time that the um, biennial conference of the International Network for the Study of Spirituality will take place outside the UK. I managed, to, I'm, 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 I'm on the board, so I managed to get them to say, listen, let's come to Ireland, it's a good time. We have a new university, spirituality studies are going on here. It wouldn't be very good to bring an international conference on spirituality studies to this university at this time, and they've gone with it. On you, Uchi. Could you address the second question? Yes, there were so many questions, which was the <laughs> remind me of the second one. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, good. Thank you, On Uchi. Yes. No, I did mention about myself as a child and how God came into my life there in a way that has influenced it ever since. I had that experience utterly unexpectedly to me uh, in a way that laid a foundation in my subjectivity. Uh, that God is a kind God, a caring God, a compassionate God, an understanding God, and I have been influenced in all my development by that since. And so that's a very big factor in why I went to Chile as a missionary in the 1980s and took on the brutal military dictatorship of General Pinochet with a lot of other people, of course, but because um, he was claiming to be a loyal Catholic and that he said we have to defend the country against uh, Marxism and infiltration of the Christian churches by Marxism and so on. Uh, and that was his view of what God was, was standing for, national security on his terms in Chile, which, which meant persecution, exile for lots of people, torture, repression, and you name it. Uh, and it was necessary to say, look, that's not authentic Christianity, what you're putting forth. Uh, authentic Christianity, if, like with the Medellin Conference and Liberation Spirituality and Theology, is on the side of the economically poor, and that is certainly not what you're at. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 but uh, I suppose what I wanted to allow for is, is that um, I didn't want to come across as kind of coming across too heavy on the God side because so many people today are engaged in a spirituality search that they feel it's more hospitable if it doesn't get closed in to God too early. Uh, and on the other hand, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of people, God and whoever, however they understand God to be, matters a great deal to them. And so we have to also let that be in, come into the, uh, the picture. But uh, not everybody has found that to be the case for their lives. So I can say, look, that's why I gave an example of my life. Uh, Hammerschild had his experience. It was an anonymous kind of, an anonymous kind of God, so to speak, for him. And I was giving an example of my, where my God was a more socialized into the Christian tradition God. Uh, and then there are people who have other experiences, you know. So um, God is there, but we have to allow for it, God being different for different people, and maybe for Marx even why it might have been not there at all for him. Uh, but <coughs> we, uh, well my, my, my center point, I suppose, is really is that the important thing is if we can all agree that we are constituted with a spirit of authenticity at work in our humanity, and if we all try to be faithful to that and see what it means for each of us and where it takes each of us, and try and understand each other as being on that common journey together, um, we have a basis for dialogue and cooperation. Uh, it won't mean we'll all end up in the same place, but it will all mean, hopefully, that we can all understand why each of us may, may, di may, di may agree to differ. Um, but for some, it will mean going very much into the God and, and, and particular affiliations of religious traditions, and then others we can allow. It may not go that way for them. And we all have to try and respect each other and appreciate each other and care for each other. The awful thing, as you know, is that so often, you know, these things are used against people, you know, you're a, and, uh, and all the damage that does. But um, if we could all see each other as people who are genuinely trying to be authentic and appreciating that there might be differences about how we see that and how we live that, but if we can all agree that's what we're all trying to do, we can all respect and appreciate and care for each other and cooperate together. Uh, in ways that are constructive. Um, and Eve. Thanks very much. Mike. Thanks, Eve. You, you have a soft okay. <coughs> Just want to say, um, first of all, thanks a million. That's really fascinating, and I hope we get a copy of it. But just one question: um, Do you think spirituality can exist can exist without an objective truth? And if it can, how would it manifest? Well, I mean, I think we're all engaged in a search for truth and goodness and love in life and how to be a person of those qualities. 
and in that sense, I don't think any of us can exist without being engaged somehow with those realities. Um, now, how objective what we arrive at is, 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 is open to question, you know. I mean, Trump might think he's being very objective where he's arrived at, but uh, I think we could actually bring new data and new questions and interpretations against him to say, I, I wouldn't agree that you're being objective there, you know, and there's a way of knowing this because objectivity is a matter of attending to all the relevant data and asking all the relevant questions and judging between different interpretations and evaluating different courses of action based on the knowledge arrived at and so on. And in that way, you know, you have a way of kind of having a conversation and a dialogue with a person uh, who is different from you. But if we all agree that that is the route, the path to the outcomes we seek, then we can all journey together on that path and see where we might differ if we do and why we, where, why we agree if we do and so on. Um, so there, I, I don't think there is spirituality without the desire and the quest and the attempt to reach truth and goodness and love. But whether the extent to which we actually arrive at beauty, truth, goodness and love, each of us in our search then is open to question all the time because of the doubt that has to be allowed for and the humility that has to be proceeded with, that the search is done with. So what do you think, Neve? I don't really know. But um, so just from m my response to what you've said, it makes it always a quest and always a journey without any definitive end point, really. And so um, like, and it's helpful that we can measure and we do have a methodology. But um, one of my questions um, in general is kind of, well, how does an authentic spirituality manifest itself in the world? Like, um, you read Marx, and they are beautiful, beautiful words, and Dag um, Hammer Hammersfield. Mm -hmm. But how do you actually, how does it translate? Because otherwise, um, yeah. sure. if, if that makes sense. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, uh, you know a person, as I say, whose authenticity is known by the level of openness, the quality of openness in a person to whatever, you know. Um, but as I said earlier with Richard, the fact that you're willing to be open and to reconsider and to doubt and to change and all that, you can't live in a state of being completely on the fence all the time. So you, you know you choose where you're going to be and you have your reasons for, for, for taking your stand there. But that doesn't mean then that you mightn't change later in the light of new evidence or whatever, you know. Um, so when I say about being open, being provisional and journeying and all that, I'm not saying that you can't ever commit. You know, we, we have to live a life of commitment somewhere, some, someone, something. Um, but having made a commitment doesn't mean that it can't be revised or modified or whatever. So in that sense, you're living with both commitment and provisionality and how does an authenticity manifests itself by 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 that that the person can be a committed person but also an open person around their commitment Bert, yes. Yeah, thanks, Michael. That was really interesting. Um, I'm wondering, because uh, the academic study of spirituality has emanated from uh, the Christian perspective, if you like, um, what would it have been like, or is there any equivalent coming out of, say, um, the Buddhist tradition, or, or uh, native traditions, even Aboriginal or uh, North American, you know, and I, and I just wonder, do our methodologies, like, um, which are developing all the time from positivism to uh, more qualitative methods and your, your own um, subjectivity and so on methods, um, but like, what would, it, what would it have been like if uh, the, or what would it be like if the academic study of spirituality were um, uh, emanated from a sort of an integration of the, the wisdom traditions, the faith traditions of the world, 
um, even like, for example, Islam uh, or, or um, uh, yeah, j just our other Middle Eastern influences, if you like. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a wondering, really. And mm -hmm. is there? A <laughs> and I suppose I think of our own indigenous uh, traditions, uh, pre-Christian, if you like, or even like the spirituality of my my parents, which was a lot of it was um, almost indigenous, if you like. Yes. Uh, yeah. And do we do it a service to those by by studying them through a Western lens, if you like? Um, do we become, are we very westernized? Yes. And, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah, mm. well, you see, I took the, I, ta I take the approach of authentic subjectivity because it's actually not western. I've been making the point all the time that it's common human. So whether people are in indigenous or Buddhists or Islam or whatever, they, they, there's a common human way of being uh, in our knowing and choosing that cuts across all that. Um, and that's why I think it has a lot to offer. Now, I agree, it, 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 the study of, Christ, of spirituality has come a lot from the Christian tradition, and that is interesting that that's the case. That's historically just the fact. And it will be interesting when more traditions and other worldviews and that come into the picture more to see what difference it might make. But it won't change the fact, in my view, that uh, this authentic subjectivity is a reality in everyone's life because it's a common human praxis. Um, it's a reflexive praxis. If every human being reflects on what am I doing when I'm knowing and choosing, uh, engaged in making meaning, we discover we have this common methodology. And, all, and methods then, you know, there's a difference between methodology and methods, as you know. Uh, me a method is a way of doing something, but a methodology really is about how you reach the real. And uh, the authentic subjectivity is a methodology about how to reach the real, how to reach the objective order and do the good that corresponds to that. And methods, all kinds of methods, like I mentioned about hermeneutic and methodology, method, methods when studying Marx, for example, and all the other methods, contemplative methods, and silence is a method, and prayer practices are methods, and all these are methods, but they're all to do with uh, allow, enabling us to be more attentive to data, to get more insight, to be able to arrive at better interpretations in the sake of making better judgments and taking decisions. These are all kind of methods of practices and methods to serve the methodology of reaching the real and doing what corresponds to reaching the real. So yeah, I, I would say that I think subjectivity is not a Western methodology. It's a common human methodology. And then it will be interesting, though, to see what other traditions, as they get more into this kind of study, have to offer. Because, of course, they will have interesting things to offer. Uh, they just haven't historically been in it in the same way as the Christian tradition has been. Um, so I'm aware that our time is probably coming to an end. John, have you a question? John, we, we're reaching you with the mic. Just for the, here it is. Uh, I don't know whether I'm holding it correctly or not. You can let me know whether I'm, I can, I'm audible. I could listen to your lecture several times over. And partially in class, I think I've already heard mo a lot of what you've said. And I know every time I would hear it, I would hear something new. And that's just by way of a compliment. Thank you. There's great depth to it, and there's many layers to it. Uh, I'm sure there are many aspects of it I haven't quite grasped yet. For me, as one of your students in the current program, um, I find sometimes the, the challenge of spirituality as you lay it out, the, the invitation, is quite exhilarating. But sometimes I find the practice is quite scary. And I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, scary because it sometimes seems to demand that I go to the core of myself. And sometimes I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of what I'm going to find. And for me, the thing that I would say, and this is probably by more of a way of an observation than a question perhaps, is sometimes I feel I need courage. It's yes. the courage to follow the practices that you speak about. Mm -hmm. Because it can be very easy to listen to a wonderful lecture, and I become quite comfortable in it. But in the reality and the grittiness of my life, sometimes I find myself lacking the courage. And I think um, of that story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What he went through, I'm not comparing myself, but that sense of self-doubt of that, can I do this? Mm -hmm. And I often feel that quite strongly when I get to the meat of what you're saying. Yes. You're right, John. Yeah, it is very... Uh, that's why I talked about the self-implicating character of the study of spirituality. 
it does demand courage and openness and uh, a willingness to be challenged and all that. Um, uh, you're right, you, you, you've got it. That is actually what's involved. And, uh, and we can want to run away and... The, the idea of transformation sounds wonderful till you get into it and you figure, this is hard work. <laughs> and I may not be who I think I am, but that I've held on to for 60 odd years. Yes. And do I want to let go of that? Yes. Do I have the courage to let go of that? Yes, yes, absolutely, John. Absolutely, uh, it, is, it is a very challenging study, a subject to study. Yeah. yeah. I suppose that's the point I, was try I think I'm trying to make now that I've got there, is it's wonderful, but it's hard work. It's it very is. challenging. It is, yeah. And it is, it is every year, and uh, you know, some of the students from here this year and other years are here, uh, often will say this has been life transforming, it's been life enhancing, uh, and they've been kind of sometimes amazed, and I'm sometimes amazed, I have to say in all honesty, at the extent to which people find this transformative process goes on in them during the year of the program. Um, but it means, it means though, when they say that, they have really engaged with the program, because if they're engaging authentically, it does do that, it does have that kind of transformative effect on you. It doesn't leave you untouched, doesn't leave you neutral, and unchanged. You will have to journey in a transformative way if you engage the program uh, authentically. Mm -hmm. And it's good when people say this because it means they have. But it takes courage yes. and it is challenging. Yes, I think there should be a health warning maybe <laughs> when you start the program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. So, yeah, right. Well, I suppose we've reached our time, Susan, have we? Our, our, our lunch is at a quarter to two, so um, it was, was going there. Um, so, should we finish? Okay, I guess we will. Thanks, thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks.